Welcome back to a special edition of the Cracked Interviews. I am here, obviously, with uh, Rajiv Ram today, and we're so excited to have you here at the Pearson Automotive Club here in Zionsville, Indiana. Very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so we'll get right to it. This past Tuesday, uh, you received a uh, the Pathfinder Award for Entourage for Kids uh, with Andy Roddick. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and um, just how that went down on Tuesday? Yeah, you know, I, it's just uh, an award that I really have to thank the rest of my group and my foundation for, Entourage for Kids. We have a board of uh, six people, and uh, it was really a team effort. Um, and to be recognized on that level, you know, with another person like Andy was was pretty special. We had a great event on Tuesday and uh, just, you know, overwhelmed and, and appreciative of the recognition. Absolutely. Um, and I actually had the uh, privilege of being there and it was a well-attended event and super cool to see you and Andy uh, kind of back and forth. And obviously he came in town um, for an exhibition match a few years ago for Entourage. Um, tell us a little bit about the foundation. Uh, you started in 2010 and gives back to local kids here in Indiana and uh, high school programs. Yeah, I mean, you know, basically the idea behind it was to try and, you know, give back to a community that served me so well. You know, I, I wouldn't have had the experiences and the opportunities that I had without the backing of my community. So, you know, now we, we raise money in various ways to basically focus on underprivileged, underprivileged high school teams and, you know, really just kids that want to play tennis, especially in the wintertime when it's expensive because it's cold here, you have to play inside, then maybe, you know, they can't quite make that happen. Um, I think tennis and sports in general is a great way to, to make, you know, for kids to make good choices as opposed to bad choices. It's, it's, you know, something to do after school. It's athletic. You learn to have, you know, social connections. Just uh, it really doesn't do anything bad for you. So I just I feel like if I can in a small way make that possible for more kids, it's, it's good. Sure, sure. And what was the genesis behind the idea? Well, just that, first of all, to have more kids in the sport. And the exhibition that we did for about six years was to kind of keep – professional tennis in the city in some capacity it's not a tournament we had the uh, Indianapolis tennis championships which is the RCA tournament you know for many years leave in 2009 so just thought that we could try and bring in some of my you know colleagues on tour to do a one night exhibition and sort of you know keep keep that awareness around sure um, and we'll get to the top notch wild card series here um, we have an event coming up at this facility which is incredible the Top Notch Wild Card Series is December 14th through the 16th, um, and there are three other locations around the Midwest. Talk about um, your roots in Carmel um, in Indiana and what the community here means to you and how um, it really uh, kick-started your career. Yeah, I grew up here uh, from sixth grade onwards. Um, went to Carmel High School, played on the high school tennis team. Really not moved anywhere since to speak. You know, I mean, I... I I didn't go to a tennis academy. I didn't. I didn't do any of that kind of stuff. Even when I turned pro, I, I kind of based myself out of here in, in Indiana. And uh, I, I just feel like there's something to be said for being grounded and being, you know, able to come back to people that are familiar to you, whether it's parents, friends, relatives, wh whatever it is. And uh, you know, I just have felt so much support out of this community throughout my whole career. Um, and I think uh, sometimes when you're having a bad time of it, and somebody gives you a little word of encouragement, you know, they enjoy watching you play. They've enjoyed watching your career. It, it, it's the little things like that that make a difference. So I've, I've really appreciated all of those, you know, comments and things uh, that I've had, no, I've gotten over the years. Absolutely. I mentioned this at the event on Tuesday. Um, you know, Indiana, especially on the national and global scale, isn't known uh, for their tennis, especially on the professional level. Um, how was that starting out as a kid here in town? Um, and you know, are you a guy that always dreamed big, always thought that that was attainable or um, kind of take us through the process and then we'll get to Illinois here in a bit too? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I ever didn't dream big, but I always thought about it as more of like a step-by-step -step process. Okay, what do I have to do today to get better tomorrow? And then whenever, wherever I end up tomorrow is, is you know, is where I end up. But I never thought about, oh, you know what, I want to you know, I have to make a career out of this. There wasn't that kind of pressure. Um, I've had the same coach for, geez, since I was 15 years old, Brian Smith. He's still in the area, and he's been responsible for, you know, uh, a bulk of the better kids that have come out of this city in the last 15, 20 years. And I think, you know, having him as a constant influence has been a real help to me. And, um, you know, that's just sort of shaped my career, that sort of um, sort of attitude of, you know, you know, taking it day by day and step by step. And then, you know, when you look back, you're like, wow, I actually, you know, ended up with quite a lot and quite quite a, you know, incredible experience and an incredible ride. Um, you've won at every level. Um, state champion at Carmel, national champion at Illinois, and then obviously we'll get to your pro career. But um, 
take us through the decision to go to Illinois, stay at a Midwest school, and um, that mental that winning mentality that you bring every day and. At the time, it was a pretty easy decision, to be honest. I mean, I was lucky that I had options, but Illinois fit exactly what I was looking for. We had a, a great coach. We had a great team full of All-American guys that I knew from growing up. You know, they had a purpose to try and improve and get better. And it was it was really the beginning or the middle, I should say, of, of something different. You know, Illinois is not a tennis powerhouse. Or it wasn't a tennis powerhouse. And, you know, they were able to sort of, you know, do things and provide a culture and create a culture that was going to, produce winners and champions and all that and I was just kind of on the tail end of that so I, I I felt like that was a you know when I took my visits and had all that went through all that process I, I felt like that was a definite right place for me and it worked out yeah clearly clearly um and you know before um you know we were on set here we were talking about your trip to South Africa yeah. with your wife um and your you know success in Paris kind of broke into the trip a little bit uh tell us about the trip a little bit how was it yeah it was pretty cool we've been talking about doing one of those safaris uh, for some time we were supposed to go for a little bit longer like you said I, I ended up having a good week in Paris so we only went for about four and a half days which is when you fly 36 hours it's a long time to go but you know the trip was awesome I mean we, we couldn't have had a better time yeah want to talk about Paris um there's been a lot of talk around the tennis community, talking heads, and I know Zverev has made some public comments as well with um, the amount of time tennis players have to dedicate to the sport. It's 11 months, and then training, um, gearing up you know, for the next year. Um, but you have somehow found a way to stay uh, smooth, and, and you, know, you pull out the, the win at Paris with Marcel. Yeah. Um, talk about that, the grind, because uh, a lot of other sports and a lot of other um, people don't necessarily know that tennis is an 11 month grind. So talk about that. A little yeah, bit. it's hard. You know, we, we, it's not only an 11 month deal. It's 11 months all over the world. You know, we start in Australia then it's back to America for a little bit, then Europe, then, you know, again in America, Asia, Europe again. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of, you know, time zone hopping and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think a big part of it is listening to your body. I actually skipped a couple of weeks. I skipped the Shanghai Masters and the Tokyo 500 tournament before Europe because I just felt like I'd played way too much this year and I needed to take 10 days and train and relax and kind of get my head right before going over to Europe for the last three tournaments. And I think um, sometimes people might look and try and chase points and chase tournaments, and I think there's a time for that. There's a time where you kind of have to push through it, but there's also a time where you kind of need to listen to your body and maybe your mind more so and just take a break and, and prepare so you can play well, you know, when the next competition comes around. And uh, it's a fine balance, but sometimes, like, this time I happened to get it right and I got lucky. So. Absolutely. Um, and how did playing with Marcel come to be? Yeah, he's a great player. Look, I've, I've played him quite a few times in singles and doubles. Played him one tough match at the U.S. Open. For me, it was tough uh, a couple of years ago. But uh, he asked me to play there. He was looking for a partner, and, and I uh, I didn't have anyone for the last part of the season. So, uh, you know, said yes immediately. He's a, he's a great player. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we gelled well right from the beginning. But it's it's one of those things where I kind of knew what he brought to the table. I think he, he knew the same. So it didn't feel like it took that long to uh, to really feel quite you know quite good out there. Sure. How, so how do you build that chemistry going into an event like that, not having played with each other? Obviously, you've played singles. You yeah. know his game. He knows yours. But how do you pick that up so quick? You said there was an instant uh, chemistry. Yeah, I, don't, I think those, that's one of those things that you don't really know. You just kind of have to feel if it's if it's working with that person or not, you know. And, and we had one practice session before the event started, and right away it felt you know it felt natural, it felt easy to just go and and play out there. And uh, you know, our first match, we had, you know, it's obviously going to always be a little bit tricky, first match jitters. But uh, even in there, we, we felt like. Uh, you know, the combination of skill sets really, really worked well. So, uh, you know, he brings a lot of energy to the court. I probably am not so much, and I'm maybe more of the calmer, calming factor, if you will. But uh, so much of it is uh, is just that, too. Like, your personalities have to match as well as your game styles. Absolutely. Um, I know before you said that you are um, you get the opportunity to spend time here at home yeah. uh, around the holidays with Thanksgiving and everything else. Um, after you kind of take some time off, rest a little bit, when are you going to start gearing up for 2019? You know, as I've gotten older, I, I've played less and less tennis over the off season. I feel like, you know, I play so much tennis during the year. I've played so much tennis in my career that I could, I could very easily overdo it, you know, and I, I want to, I don't need to be sharp during the off season. I need to be sharp come, you know, the third week of January during the Australian Open. So for me, it's all about the fitness part of it, getting, and that's not, doesn't mean getting, you know, killing myself in the gym. That means, you know, straighten out my body, making sure my injuries are all taken care of, and then also progressing a little bit. So I started that, uh, 
back in the gym on Monday. Um, I'm going to be going pretty much five days a week, six days a week through November, most of December. And then tennis will start for me right around the second week of December, I would say. Uh, I'll probably hit five times between now and then just to kind of keep everything sharp. But sure. uh, the real training stuff, it's not the – like when I was younger, I, I would do, you know, four weeks of tennis to, to make sure I'm, you know, fully ready. And I feel like I just – that will do more harm than good at this point to me. Um, so this is kind of an inside joke uh, with the Cracked Rackets team. I can't do an interview without talking about uh, a player's dietary regimen. Um, how strict are you uh, with that and uh, kind of take us through that? I would say I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, there are some guys out there who are incredibly strict. I don't think I have that capacity to be that strict, but I will say at these tournaments they, they do a nice job of making sure the food that we eat is generally good. You know, So it's tough to... It's tough to screw up too badly. Um, uh, I kind of go along the lines of if it feel if it makes me feel good, I'm going to eat it. If it doesn't make me feel good, I'm not going to eat it. And so I, I've over the years kind of figured out what my what my you know niche is in the food area, if you will. Have you worked with the nutritionist? Uh, mar marginally, marginally. But I, I also feel like so much of nutrition and and really everything is personalized. You know, like you have to understand what your body can handle and what you can't handle. You know, and I think that's a uh, Trial and error is really a, a big way to do that, and, and for me, that's at least been the best way. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to one of your comments earlier. You mentioned Brian Smith, who's mm -hmm. been your coach uh, since you were in, in the juniors. Yeah. Talk about um, how you all have grown together through the progression of your career and what he's meant to you uh, personally as well. Yeah, he's, he's really meant everything. Um, you know, when I started, when I was 15, he was 25, so he was just – finishing school and working a little bit up in Muncie where he went to he went to Ball State and you know he kind of took me aside one day at the Como Rat Club where he where he started to work at and he's like hey let's hit once a week I said okay fine you know and he was way better than me at the time so what was really nice though is that you know he would play he would beat me and then he would explain to me why he was beating me and that really kind of I remember to this day I'm 34 and I remember when I was 15 the guy telling me like look these are the things that you're not very good at and this is why I can why I can, you know, beat you on these certain occasions, and these are the things you are good at, and these are the things I try to avoid. And it was, it was a very tactical way of talking to me about it, which I thought at the time was really interesting. And so we kind of have got, had a lot of back and forth. I'd say our relationship is much more friend than coach-player, and, uh, you know, he's learned through me. I've learned, obviously, through him, and I think we've both, you know, grown together, uh, you know, throughout my career. And then he's obviously gone on to have a lot of success with a lot of the other, a lot of other players from Indiana. I think he's had four U.S. number ones, if I'm not mistaken, um, in the last 10 years or so. Yeah. With Brooke and Ronnie yeah. Schneider. And Samir Kumar yep. and, uh, and myself. And, uh, you know, I think there's a couple more in the works. So I think there's uh, there's he's going to start, you know, continue to see success with uh, with his kids. Absolutely. Um, and especially on the fo the footwork side, he works with uh, our younger brother, Presley. OK. And just yeah. as a footwork specialist, I, you know, I feel like he's um, top notch for yeah. sure. Um, but any recommendation you would have for someone, um, you know, if you were in your shoes uh, back 16, 17, going through the recruiting process, mm -hmm. um, what would you tell yourself um from a school perspective, uh, visits, uh, scholarships, et cetera? The first thing I would say is you have to trust your gut. I think I took five visits. I got to go to some great schools. I went to Georgia. I went to Tennessee, um, Illinois, Ohio State. And I think it's, it's a bit cliche to say, but you kind of know where you fit. And I think maybe some people are going to be in a situation, like for me, for example, like I could have taking a visit to Stanford or some of the maybe quote-unquote bigger name schools at the time and I actually got people tell me well why wouldn't you go there why would you go to Illinois and it just it just felt right you know it felt like you know they wanted me it was close to home which I had always you know valued it you know they had the right culture a lot of the things were were going the right direction and even though it may not be the popular choice I think the, the biggest thing is you, you really got to trust your gut because at that point, you know, as a tennis player, if you're in the position to get recruited by a lot of schools, you're obviously doing something right, you know, and I think uh, I think uh, you, you don't want to get led down a wrong path because of what somebody else says. Sure, sure. Well, um, you've won an Olympic silver medal with Venus Williams, uh, semifinals at the U.S. Open, Wimbledon, career high number 11. Uh, but one of the things that really sticks out to you uh, looking back on your career um, is those team memories mm -hmm. of both high school and college. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, tennis is such an individual sport. We play, like you said, 11 months a year for the last, for me, you know, 25 years of 
for myself. You know, I play singles, I play doubles. It's still for yourself. And so the few times in my career when I've had to get, gotten to play on a team, whether it's high school or college or, you know, the Olympics or whatever, it's really special. It's different, you know, and I think I, I really enjoy that. I really enjoy having teammates. I really enjoy having something bigger to play for than myself. And so, you know, whatever level it may be, I think I would highly recommend it if you get the chance to, to do that. Yeah. Uh, Waver Cup has been a smashing success. Um, do you think the ATP World Tour needs to kind of consider doing more team events like that to um, be a little more relatable to this next generation of tennis fans and players? I think it would be a smart idea. I mean, they've got the World Team Cup in the works, which is going to happen, I think, in 2020 in Australia if, uh, if all goes well which is going to be a nation versus nation thing. Um, so I think that's a good start for sure. But I think, yeah, relatability to fans and, and, and really getting having the people who are watching, you know, have something to get behind. Like another thing that I didn't mention before was I played World Team Tennis a few years. Now, it's only three weeks in the summer, but, you know, you play for a city and you have fans that, that get behind you because you're a part of that city. It, it's, again, just sort of like any other pro, pro league. It's, it, really, it really makes it easy for the fans to, to enjoy that sport. And in that same breath, um, talk about your experience at the Olympics, um, what it meant to represent your country. Um, you didn't play with Venus before then, yeah. um, and then obviously you had great success there. Uh, so kind of share with us a little bit about that. Just to, just to be on the team was great. You know, we got to go to the opening ceremonies and just be a part of the Olympic Village and Look, you know, it's it's every other great athlete or every great athlete in the whole world, more or less, is in the same place at the same time, which I, I was just so almost overwhelmed to be there, you know. And then we start playing our competition. And it's funny, once the competition got started, it became more of just like a regular tennis tournament, you know. And then at the end, when we ended up making the finals, and we, we lost, but we still we still made a silver to be on a podium, you know, watch the American flag go up and, you know, it again became a bit surreal because, you know, when you're in a trophy ceremony in a regular situation, it's just about you, but this is like, I'm playing for my country, you know, and it's a, it's a whole different, it's a whole different feeling really. Oh, yeah. um, we talked about this earlier. Um, we have the top notch wildcard series coming in December, mm -hmm. um, a pre qualifier for the 75 K in January up in Cleveland. Um, does the Indianapolis tennis community need a professional tennis event? I mean, we had the RCAs, like you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, through this, you know, movement with the the top notch series, um, we've kind of got things in the works for a 75k in 2020. Yep. Um, do you think that would be sustainable? And do you think that uh, people would come out? Look, I certainly hope it'd be sustainable. I, I can only speak from a personal standpoint. I was a ball boy at the RCA Championships in '97. I think I was 12 or 13 years old. I ball boyed for Carlos Moya and Jonas Bjorkman and a couple of guys that I even played against later on. And like, actually, I played against Bjorkman before too. So it was, I, I I was 12 or 13, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I remember watching Pete Sampras practice with Todd Martin for. I sat there for an hour just thinking that was the coolest thing ever. So look, I know that that was a big deal for me. So if that can happen, even as you know, the challenger players are players that are going to be great players. You know, there's somebody in there that's going to end up making a big breakthrough. So if that can inspire you know, the kids around here to, you know, take up tennis a little more seriously or something like that. I think it's hugely needed in a city like this. Um, I, I know personally it was a, it was a big effect on me. Um, and I certainly hope it comes back. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of, um, we need to give a plug to Pearson Automotive Club. Yeah. Uh, this is a state of the art facility. Uh, the lighting is, is incredible. Um, Kind of give a little plug to Pearson. Yeah, and look, I, it's actually I haven't been here too much because uh, it's just been you know recently opened, but uh, it's a beautiful facility. It's it's kind of what the city needed a little bit more, you know, some more indoor space to play and you know outdoor courts as well, and just a nice place for families to hang out and have fun playing tennis. It's a and we really do appreciate them, you know, letting us use their space uh, for our event today. Absolutely. Um,